Ladies. I am Gina. And my name is Elias, and we get the awesome privilege to share with you some financial concepts that have made a huge difference in our lives and many lives of our friends and families and clients as well. So one of the things we believe in is financial education, and it is the foundation to financial freedom. Tonight, as Erica said, this is part one of four, and tonight's topic is How Money Works, a Common Sense Guide to Financial Success. Another um, concept that we believe is word of mouth. 72% of people get news from friends and family. So, which makes word of mouth the most popular channel for sharing. So when you think of someone, please write their name down and, and let them know, hey, there's a financial um, services webinar available for you. And then we've also found that there is common misunderstanding that average and ordinary folks can't become financial independent. That can be further from the truth. The fact is you have the power to accumulate wealth. Many people who never earned a six figure income become financially independent. How do they do it? So take a pic of this and frame it as a reminder. These are the things that you can do. You can get out of debt. You can build savings. You can get on the path to financial freedom. No matter your income level, you can achieve financial security. So if you take the time to learn just a few simple concepts about how money works. Did you know one of the biggest financial mistakes most people make is dependence? Mm. Dependence on others. And it allows outside factors in people's lives to control them. The secret to financial security is learning to control the things you can control. Now here are some of the things you can do to help yourself and take control of your finances. One, pay yourself first. Two, adjust your priorities. Change your thinking about money and about finance. Adjust your lifestyle. Earn additional income. Avoid the credit traps and set goals and have a plan. The things on the left, you have no control of. Run from them. You know, you don't have control of the taxes. You don't have control over um, Social Security. So run from those things again. The things on the right side, you have full control of. You have control over your savings for retirement, other sources of income. With, if you want financial freedom. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing that we like to tell people is to pay yourself first. <clears throat> what happens is, is the, the problem at the end of the month, most people don't have anything left to save. You have bills, you have children, you have all types of food, all types of things that you need to take care of. And so you don't have any money left at the end of the month. Um, my mom used to say the the money runs out, but the month doesn't, right? Solution, at the first part of the month, you before you ever pay anyone else, write a check to yourself for 10% for of your income. Okay, 10% of your income. Pay your tithes. <clears throat> now, we believe in paying tithes, but pay yourself as well. And then, uh, paying, what you got to understand is paying yourself first may be the single most important concept of this whole presentation. So let's take a look at that. Um, one of the concepts we like to teach is it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. Okay? So, everyone take out a, pen, a piece of paper real quick. I hope you're taking notes. I hope you're writing stuff down because... Uh, this is important information. So take a piece of paper out, and at the top of the paper, put your average annual income since you've been working. What is your average income? And just guess. It doesn't have to be specific down to the dollar, down to the cents, mm -hmm. some of my technical people. But just give me a general average of what you've made over your working life. And then multiply that by the number of years that you've actually worked. All right? whether it's 20 years, 15 years, 50 years, right? And then get that number, and that equals the amount of money that you've earned over your working life. Now, <clears throat> um, uh, um, take your personal savings. What do you have saved in your long-term, short-term emergency fund? What do you have com collectively saved? And then you divide the money of the um, a number of money that you, the number of money the amount of money you have saved into the amount of money that you've earned over your working life that tells you the percent 
of your income that you've been able to save, right? So what you need to do is put yourself at the head of the line. Treat your savings like any other recurring bill that you must pay every month. Be very disciplined. While most people are thinking nothing about saving enormous amounts of money, about nothing, sending enormous amounts of money to their bills, their credit cards, their mortgages, their car notes, right? Um, send money to yourself on a regular basis, systematically. Pay yourself first. Um, and then the way you want to do that, the, the system that we use is a three-account approach, okay? So you'll need an emergency fund. This is your, your reserve fund so that um, um, if the emergency pops up, you don't have to go into your savings, right? If the clutch blows out in your car, the refrigerator acts up, right? You need to take an emergency trip. That's where you want to put your emergency savings, all right? A good rule of thumb is to have three to six months of salary in your emergency fund. Then you want a short-term savings account. This account is for money that you set aside for expenses that you want to purchase within a short-term time frame. For example, here's where you save for a new computer or maybe a vacation or maybe even a down payment on a home. All right? And then your long-term savings or your investment accounts, this is where you're going to put your retirement savings, your college fund, any other long-range savings um, that, you, that you want. These savings have more of a long-term horizon, and so you can use investment vehicles with potentially high rates of return, such as equity mutual funds. And we'll show you how that works. The other thing you want to do is use time and consistency. Once Somebody said once that the only two things that life get, really gives you is opportunity and time. So you take that time, you combine it with two other uh, very important elements, rate of return, and I hope you're writing this down, rate of return, not interest rate, but rate of return, and consistency. The three of those mixed together is a powerful key to reaching your financial goals. Okay? So, let's think about this. Suppose your parents deposited $1,000 on the day you were born into an account, right? And you left it there until you turned 67, never touched it. That $1,000 would have grown to over $400,000 without ever having added any other money, not a single penny, and that would have turned to 400 grand. Um, if you saved until age 16, you would have saved that thousand dollars. Till age 16, you'd have $96,000. That's an amazing college fund, right? So for your new, uh, your babies, your nieces, your nephews, your grandchildren, throw a thousand dollars in if you wanna give them something special, Save $1,000 for them, put it in an account, and don't touch it, and give it to them at 16 or at 18 when they get ready to go to school, okay? <clears throat> so, think about this. If you're like most people, you don't have a lot of money, and that's why time is so critical. You have to use time. When you're, when you're young, you can save small amounts and still end up with thousands of dollars at the end. If you want to begin saving, you must save much more. One thing is certain. You can't afford the high cost of waiting. Um, we talk to young people all the time. Um, I have a young man that I just worked with, fully funded his IRA for last year, and is fully funding his IRA. By the time he gets to ready, ready to retire, he'll have something in the, in the tune of $40 million in his investment because he's a young man and he's starting. But think about this. If you, uh, <clears throat> if you want to save $500,000 for retirement at age 67, right, and you begin at age 25, you got to save $89 a month. But if you wait 10 years, that $89 turns into $224 that you need to save. If you wait another 10 years, you got to save uh, about six times that much. If you wait till you're 55 to save money for retirement, you have to save 19, about $2,000 a month. That's 21 more times than the $89 that if you started at an at at early age. So you understand how the cost of waiting, every day that you wait to start savings, you're costing yourself money. This is one um, rule that I, I love. It's, it's, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, it's called the rule of 72. Actually, it's called the banker's rule, but the bankers don't really teach this rule to you, <laughs> right? It's the rule that the bank uses to get wealthy, but they don't teach it to us, right? Because bankers work for the bank. They're not customer-ers. Customer-ers? <laughs> 
They don't work for you. They work for the bank. So they're going to make money for the bank. Okay, so check this rule out. Rule of 72. You, it says if you take the rate of return that you get on your money, you divide that into 72, it approximately tells you how many years it takes for your money to double. So what, you'll, what you're going to learn is the amount of doubling periods that you have in your life makes a huge difference. All right? So let's say um, grandma passed away, Nana passed away, and she left you $10,000. And you ran down to the bank, to Bank of America or Chase, and stuck that money in the bank. Right now, the banks were giving, well, up until a couple weeks ago, the banks were giving a 1% rate of return. So they're not even on my slide, right? <clears throat> but I don't know if you saw this. Um, I think it was last week or maybe two weeks ago, um, the Federal Reserve dropped the interest rate to point. Two five, so a quarter of a percent. So banks aren't even getting one percent. So you should get angry right, right at that by itself. All right. So think about this: ten thousand dollars in a three percent vehicle, and that money was going to three into seventy two is, is twenty four. So your money's going to double every twenty four years. So that ten thousand dollars is going to turn to twenty thousand. It's going to turn into forty thousand by the time you're forty eight. So if you got bit more doubling periods, right, <clears throat> your money's going to double faster. 6 into 72 is 12. So every 12 years, that $10,000, I understand this is a one-time $10,000 investment. It's going to double by itself because of compound interest. By 48, you'll have 160. Now, if you're able to get a 12% rate of return, 12 goes into 72 six times. What do you think that number is going to be at the bottom there if, at, uh, at age 48 or the 48 years, rather? What do you think that number is going to be? I know you can't say it, but I'm going to show you. $2.5 million is what you're going to have. So understand this. This is the same amount, of, same amount of time, same amount of money, right? The same amount of effort on your part, and, but you're just tweaking the interest rate that you're getting. And it's going to give you $2.5 million. Now, understand this. I just told you the banks are giving a quarter of percent. So 0.25%, not even 1%. So if they're giving 2.25%, and there's 12% available, what do you think they're doing with your money? I'll tell you. They take your money and they invest it and get the 12% and give you the 0.25%. So when you're looking at that money, um, if I was your friend, think about this. If I was your friend and I said, hey, Monica, Monica T.L. Lewis, give me $10,000. I'm going to invest it for you. I took that money and I invested it, and I came back and I said, "Girl, look, I gave, I got you forty thousand dollars, and I gave you forty grand." You would be excited about that. But if you knew I made two point five million dollars on your money and only gave you forty grand, what would you think about me as your friend? You'd probably be a little angry, wouldn't you? You probably wouldn't be too happy with me. You'd probably come looking for me. It's what would probably happen, right? So understand that that's what the banks are doing to us every day, day in and day out. Right? They give you 0.25, but they charge you 8% on a car loan. They charge you 6% on a mortgage. They charge you 29% on a credit card. That's your money they're using. They're recycling your money. Okay? So get angry about that. <clears throat> so how to get to financial freedom? Let's start by paying off our debt, okay? Of all the threats to your financial security, none is more dangerous than debt. And every family's quest to feel good financially Debt is the most common enemy. The very fact that it is so common, who doesn't have debt? It makes it one of the most biggest threat to our financial well-being, okay? So the bad news about compounding. Compound interest is one of the most powerful financial forces around. Take a look at this slide while I'm talking. When you are building a savings, its power works in your favor. However, when you're in debt, that same power of compound interest works against you, me, him. It, don't, it doesn't matter where you're from. It's going to work against you. So when you pay just the minimum balance on your credit cards, interest charges are added to each month to the remaining principal. Okay? So each month, your new balance is the principal plus the interest that they added on. And that amount gets compounded again and again and again, and you don't see a difference on your, your balance. It's easy to see how small debts grow large with compound interest. Again, look at this example. Let's say you bought a 4K television, $3,000. It's on sale, you know, the day after Thanksgiving. You put it on a credit card and you're making minimum payments. It's going to take you 
10 years to pay off $3,000, but you've also paid $2,000 and $2 extra. So you really did not get that TV on sale. You paid full price. <laughs> yes. Okay? So think about that when you're you're out shopping and you want that TV or you want that whatever. Think about, am I going to pay this off at the end of the month so I don't accrue any interest? So let's talk about revolving debt versus fixed debt. Again, take a look at this slide. You have revolving debt of $17,000. Again, you go out and buy a car. Same thing with that television example I just gave you. Go buy a car for $17,000 at 18% and you're paying $595 a month. It's going to take you 17 years, 17, 17 years to pay off $17,000 in addition to that interest, $12,500. So again, you still haven't gotten anything on sale. You're still paying full price or even more. So credit card debt is what is known as as I said, revolving debt. The interest compounds daily inside, instead of monthly, which means you can pay much more in interest because there is no fixed amount that you can pay each month. Your debt can go on forever. Additionally, your interest rate could change at almost any time and there is little a consumer can do. We can't do anything about that beyond paying off the entire balance at once. And who has $17,000 ready available? So this concept is what we teach our, our clients. Debt stacking. This is one of my favorites because I believe that I invented it. So, <laughs> and I'm going to take that with me. Love it. So if you have the idea of paying off your debt, it seems overwhelming considering debt stacking. Okay. That's what happened to me. I was overwhelmed. I wanted it done. So they say you can eat an elephant one bite at a time. Well, the same concept works with you paying your debt off. By taking, <clears throat> excuse me, by taking into account the interest rate, not the rate of return, we're talking about the interest rate, and the amount of debt and debt stacking identifies an ideal order for you to pay your debts off. So, you begin by making consistent payments on all of your debts. We'll start with the first one, retail card. You pay that until you paid it off. Well, once that card is paid off, you go on to your next debt. You don't spend that 220 on something else and go buy a TV that you think is on sale. <laughs> what you're going to do is you're going to get that 220 and add it to your next debt, which is credit card number two. And you're going to do that until you're done with all your debt. And wow, look at that. You have $2,720. What do you do with it? Well, with those extra dollars, it can help you reduce the effect of compound interest working against you. As each debt is paid off, you apply the amount you were paying to the debt to the payment that you were making in the next account. So debt stacking allows you to make the same total monthly payment each month toward all your debt. And it works best when you do not accrue any new debts. Don't go buy anything on sale while you're trying to get out of debt. I know it's hard, but hey, it's about discipline. You can continue this process until you have paid off all your debt. When you finish paying off your debts, you can apply the amount to um, your financial independence, creating wealth, generational wealth for your family, for your children, your children's children, for generations to come. That is the ultimate goal. Pay off debt and create generational wealth. The other thing is you don't have to figure this out. It looks like a, a, a crazy math drill, and I think it kind of is. But we have some tools that we can help you. We can sit down, and we do this for free. We'll sit down with you, and we'll work through this debt scenario so that you can figure it out. We can figure it out. Exactly. So avoid these common mistakes. Not valuing your credit. Keep an eye on that. That's important. There's no need to raise your credit card limits. Stay within your means or even below. Not monitoring, to, monitoring your credit history, like I said, is just not a smart move, okay? And your score. Look at that. Look at your history. Look at your score because you don't know, you know, what identity theft. That is on the rise. So just pay attention to 
your finances and then not knowing your interest rates and fees and actually knowing what an interest rate is versus a rate of return. And one important thing that we found out was knowing your statement dates. Um, there's a whole concept to um, knowing your statement dates on your credit cards and on your debt and paying your debt according to your statement dates, not to your due dates. That way you avoid a lot of interest that way. And we can show you that. We can show you how to do that. Yes. <clears throat> so one of the most important expenditures that average family should make is their life insurance. Is also one of the most misunderstood. <clears throat> so the wisdom of your life insurance purchase could make a major difference in your family security. Should you die and your quality of life if you don't die? Okay, so um, this is how it works. Think about this. How much is your car worth? Do you insure it? Yes, legally you have to. How much is your house worth? Do you have home insurance? Do you have renter's insurance? How much is your life worth? Probably a lot more than your car and your house, right? But do you have life insurance? You, th the point is, is you cannot afford to not have life insurance. But you got to buy the right type. Okay? So this is how it works. In the early years, you have debt. You have children. You have mortgages. You have financial responsibility. If one of your income, or if you're single, if your income is lost, is devastating to the people that you leave behind. But then, once you retire, once you get downrange and retire, you don't need expenditures, and your responsibilities are pretty much gone. They've grown and gone away. The kids usually have gone and grown away, grown and gone away, or the mortgage is gone, the debt's paid off. Now, at this point, you need income coming in. You need to systematically figure out how you're going to afford your lifestyle for the rest of your life. And you don't need to make payments. So think about this. The most powerful concept about life insurance is, is, is learning how to eliminate the need for life insurance, building an estate. And that's what we show you how to do. Okay, we can show you how to do that. You become self-insured. This is something that the wealthy people understood is to become self-insured. For instance, if you had $2 million sitting in the bank, would you still need to pay for a $100,000 life insurance policy? No, you are self-insured. So the goal is accumulation. We need to accumulate wealth, and then, we, then, then we're home free. <clears throat> um, this slide is just some of what the experts say. Term insurance is pure protection. Um, there's only one type of life insurance that makes sense for the majority of family is term insurance, not whole life, not universal life, none of those policies. Um, it's term insurance because term insurance gives you the most coverage for the least amount of money and for a period of time while you're building your estate. Okay, does that make sense? Say yes. 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 Um, and this is all in the, falls in the line of becoming an owner and not a loner. <clears throat> so if you have life insurance for your whole life, what you're doing is you're paying premiums, you're loaning them your money, and they're doing stuff with your money, uh, interest, they're, they're, they're uh, um, getting these exorbitant uh, rates of return on their money, and, and, and they're growing money, and they're using your money to do it. But here's what you need to do is become a, an owner, right? We cut out the middleman. What does that mean? <clears throat> The banks takes their money and pays the current rate, maybe around 1% at this time. Is, 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 at the time of the slide, it was probably 1%, but now it's a quarter of a percent. Check that out. And then loans the money out and invests that money directly in the economy. The bank receives high rates of return, high interest, and is happy about to, to give you low interest rates for the use of your money. As a general rule, what you really have is a loaning account rather than a savings account. So every account that you have at a bank, it's a loaning account. Not a savings account. Remember, you, you're talking to a banker. He works for the bank. He don't work for you. You're lending your money to the bank, and they're making a profit off your money. You have no choice but to reverse the situation if you want to make your money work for you, not for the bank. You must become an owner, not a loaner. You must learn to bypass the middleman. I know this is all new concepts, but, man, you can do this, okay? Trust me. <clears throat> Even though you may feel, com uh, feel comfortable with the fact that investments in the bank's are, uh, are um, and savings and loans, they're guaranteed by FDIC, and um, but you don't understand the impact of inflation if you haven't considered that, right? So let's look at this. <clears throat> you invest $10,000 at a 1% rate of return at the local bank. You earn for the year $100 on that, that $10,000, right? 
So, but you pay $25, $25 in taxes if you're at a 25% tax rate, anywhere from 22 to 28% tax rate. And so your net earnings are $75, right? 100 minus 25, 75. So your, result, your resulting balance would be $10,075. But if inflation is 3%, your buying power is reduced to $9,782. So you're actually losing money by sticking your money in underperforming vehicles, like a bank. Now, here's another concept that 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 we 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 teach and that um, has been around for a while. It's a three-legged stool. For many years, financial experts have used this analogy of a three-legged stool to, to demonstrate the primary sources to provide retirement income. But gone are the days that you can count on a pension from your employer or retirement at your job. Um, actually, the stat is company-sponsored retirement and pension programs account for about 40% of your income right now. So if you make $40,000 a year, when you retire, that retirement that you've been saving at your job was going to give you about $16,000 a year for your retirement. All right? So you have your company pensions. You have your personal savings. You have your Social Security. And that's supposed to provide you with the, um, the means to, to retire. But the pensions are gone, right? Social Security is questionable. Your personal savings now, that's what you're left with, really. How much do you have saved? Are you saving outside of your job? Are you saving outside of a bank? And what we're going to teach you is how to, how to invest, not just save money, but invest money. Because save money, you could, you could put money into uh, your mattress. You're saving money. You're getting a 0% rate of return. But we want to teach you how to invest money. So with the problem of low returns in safe investments, where can you go to have potential to get the kind of rate of return that you need to keep ahead of the savings game? The answer is, and somebody's asking this question, the answer is equity investments, the stock market. So you can invest in a stock market, right? You've heard about this. But the one thing you want to be cautious of is you don't want to put, uh, your mom has told you this. My mom has told me this. Your mom probably told me. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? So you want to diversify your investments. And a great way to do that is with equity mutual funds. <clears throat> mutual funds invest with per professional money management. Mutual funds are a great way to become an owner, not a loaner. They give average an opportunity, the average and ordinary folks an opportunity to invest in the economy with professional management. So no doubt there's a little bit of risk. After all, you're buying little pieces of the economy. And the economy is influenced by many factors, right? Um, politics, war, uh, uh, w uh, weather. I mean, all these things affect the economy. Pandemic. But in exchange for that risk, you have the potential for higher rate of return. All right? Let's take a look. So mutual funds are a way for you to, um, together with many other investors, we collectively Pool your money together and invest directly into the economy. Okay, so if I if I if I went back, I'll go back just a little bit. Uh, there. <clears throat> so your money, you bypass the middleman, which is the savings and loans and the banks and the credit unions, and you invest directly into the economy. And the way you do that is through through professional money management, mutual funds. The money managers use their knowledge of securities and the changing market conditions to invest the pool assets in many different companies with a variety of industries. So they're spread out all over the industries. So they invest a little bit in Microsoft, a little bit in Amazon, a little bit in Coca-Cola, a little bit in um, um, biotech and technology and um, 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 socially conscious funds, whatever. Right. And the thing is, is some of those companies are going to go up and some of these companies are going to go down. But the professional money managers know how to how to rebalance that money to make it grow. Now, understand this, that their income is directly tied to the performance of that mutual fund. So doggone right. They're going to make it make money. They're going to make money for you. They're going to make money for themselves. OK. <clears throat> so this is a, a, a really interesting concept. Um, 
if you take a look at these two these two investors, right? You have investor A and investor B, and they're both, both going to invest $100 a month. Which would you rather invest in, the rising market or the, um, the fluctuating market? <clears throat> Think about it. Would you want your money to go up or money to go like this and fluctuate? So, investor A began purchasing his or her shares as the market, the rising market. That's what we would typically say, right? Um, so, investor A begins purchasing his or her shares at the market rising cost. Right after investor B started purchasing his shares as well, the market fell and, recover, and um, recovered to where it was at the beginning of the investment period. See, it went back to $100 a share, or $10, excuse me, $10 a share. Now, investor B was able to take advantage of the downturn in the market and use his $100 a monthly to purchase shares at lower price, which meant more shares purchased, accumulation. So with his $600, he purchased 125.95 shares at an average price of $4.76 per share. Think about this. Investor A invested that $600 still, purchased 42 shares, not 125, but 42 shares at an average price of $14.19 a share. So in a fluctuating market, Investor B was able to accumulate more shares at a lower price than Investor A did. So think about this again. This is called dollar cost averaging, meaning what goes up must come down. But if you invest systematically over time, you're going to take advantage of the dips in the market. It's just like Nordstrom went on sale. Ladies, Nordstrom went on sale. The shoes all went on sale and they're half price. Are you going to run out of the store and say, I'm not paying half price for those shoes. I want to pay full price. No, no. She said she would buy two shoes, right? So two, not two shoes, two pairs of shoes. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you buy two shoes. Yeah. I did that one time. Oh, anyway, okay. um, so you take advantage of the, of the fluctuating market and you accumulate more shares. Look at this. So month one. Hundred um, price per share was ten dollars. Month two price was twelve dollars. Month three fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, and then twenty. So you're paying more and more for the cost of the shares. And investor B paid ten dollars, seven dollars, four dollars, two dollars, six dollars, and ten dollars. That's how they were able to accumulate three times the amount of shares. Now let's answer this question all over again. Where would you rather invest your money in the rising market or a fluctuating market? Fluctuating. <clears throat> so, uh, there's three D's that we teach as far as, <laughs> thank you. There are three D's that we talk about in, in, of investing. The three D's of investing. It's dollar cost averaging, discipline, and diversification. Dollar cost averaging is investing a certain fixed amount each month regardless of what's happening in the stock market. Whether it's up or whether it's down, you'll be able to take advantage of the market highs and the lows purchasing fewer units when the prices are high and purchasing more units when the prices are low. You've heard buy low and sell high, haven't you? That's what dollar cost averaging gives you an opportunity to do, and you do that systematically. Then it's discipline. Stay focused. Stay investing throughout the, all the market activity. When you think the market is, is in the toilet, invest more money, right? When you are, are, are uh, wrestling with buying that 4K TV that Gina was talking about or investing your money that you're supposed to invest, Go ahead and invest your money and, de and delay gratification, but using um, um, the, the discipline of staying, of, of staying the course. And then diversification. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to spread it out. And the good way to do that, like I said, is mutual funds. So the path to financial independence starts with understanding a few basic concepts and then implementing them. Winning the financial war is a result of winning tiny battles on a day-to-day -day basis. If you put together a simple plan to follow it, you'll be amazed at the progress you can make. This is a beautiful quote. You wanna... We all have dreams. In order to make dreams come into reality, it takes an awful lot of determination, dedication, self-discipline, and effort. Amen. So we all have dreams. Do you... <clears throat> Want to actually see them, or you just want to keep them in your head, just floating <laughs> around? So, in closing, I mean, this has been an amazing time. Thank you. Uh, 
So build confidence by applying some of these principles and, and ensure to ensure your financial freedom. <laughs> yes, I want to see mine too. So get started. That's the hardest part usually is getting started. Just put some of these practices in place. Talk to us. Follow up with us. We can help you do that. And it doesn't cost anything to sit down and figure a game plan out. All right? Tap into your resources. Get your own financial game plan done. Please do that. And then thirdly, each one teach one. If you found something that was, was impactful, that was helpful to you, that you felt was beneficial, tell somebody. Don't keep it to yourself, but tell somebody. Share that information. Okay? So... <clears throat> we want to, uh, um, in closing, we want, we're, we're going to have question and answer period of time. Um, so if you have question and answer or questions, we have answers. <laughs> if you have questions, go ahead and click the Q and a button and, 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 um, drop your questions in. But while we're doing that, we just want to give a special thanks to the King Seattle King County chapter of the NAACP to our friend, Second Vice President Eric Conway, to the President Miss Carolyn R Riley Payne, Miss Payne, thank you so much. Um, and we also want to join, um, um, invite you to join the NAACP. If you go to www.seattlekingcountynaacp.org/forward/slash/membership, you can then, for um, I think as low as forty dollars a year, can join the NAACP, or you can be a uh, I can't remember what they're called, charter member or silver gold member. Um, but go there, go and join and, and, and help impact this our community. So we'd like to thank you for attending and, and being being patient with us as we work through our technical challenges. Um, we, we really want to know how we did. We really want to know your feedback. We want to hear your feedback. So um, <clears throat> you have the uh, chat, the URL? Yes, it, it's in the chat. Oh, it's in URL. the chat. URL. It's in there. Oh, there it is right there. Yeah. Oh, you did that. I, that's what I said. I did that. Oh, but we don't, only the panelists see it. No. Panelists and attendees. Oh, you're awesome. So, <laughs> that's why we work Partnership together. At that's best. what we were together. Um, if you would please do us a favor and click that link right there and, and tell us how we did. We, we, we want you to take a quick survey. Just ask a few questions. If you found an information, if the information is valuable, um, and then if you would like us to follow up with you. Also, there is a quick video that you'll see at the end of the survey. We would love for you to all watch that quick video. It's about 18 minutes, but it gives you some, um, some more information and some resources. And if you think that this information is powerful and valuable, it kind of gives you an idea of how you can take this information and share this with other people and possibly earn some money doing it. So thank you for your, your time tonight. Um, we're, we really appreciate it. We're going to turn it back over to Sister Second Vice President, Miss Erica Conway. You're, you're muted. Sorry about that. I was just talking away. Um, I learned a lot. And um, if I could just make a couple of comments, the emergency fund. I, I start and then that's it. How do I start and continue on? Do you, do you know what I mean? Because I always have a hard time. Um, I'll, I'll dip into it. And I know that's not what I need to be doing. So you, do you have any pointers for those that will start an emergency fund and then um, just try to encourage them or something that they could just continue on to putting that money away because I always know it's so important. Is Are you uh, dipping into the emergency fund for emergencies? Of course not. Of course not. Okay. So <laughs> I'm being honest. I'm being transparent. Here. I appreciate that. Thank you for bearing your soul. Um, it's the second D in, dollar, in uh, the three Ds that we're talking about tonight. Okay. It's discipline. Discipline. You have to uh, um, develop the discipline to stop taking the money out. Here's what you can do. For your emergency fund, you can set up a money market account. 
and okay. you can systematically invest in a money market account. They don't get a lot of interest, but they're very liquid. You can get the money in seven days if you need it, if you have an emergency. But that extra step of having to go and order the money keeps you out of your savings, out of your debit card, or which because a lot of what and you got you're probably like me. I'm I'm the spender, she's the saver, but you're probably like me. You probably put money in your checking account and call it an emergency fund. And I'm just gonna leave that there because that's my <laughs> emergency fund. But what you're doing is playing a game with yourself. Right. You know you're gonna get in there. You know it ain't no emergency fund. That's just a right. slush fund, is what that's called. Right. But right. you need to put it put it away into a, a money market. So you have to order it. And I promise you, when you're typing in that and you're thinking, ah, I really don't need them shoes, that's okay. Right. And then the mer- by by the time you get it, the emergency is over. Your so so called emergency is over, right? That is right. so true. Mm-hmm. The other thing is, I just want to make sure that there is no other question. The other thing is, I wrote this down because I definitely was taking notes. So for those of us that have kids in college, you know, you've taken out loans to get them to college because you didn't know anything about this whole money and saving for college. And they were not um, as disciplined in getting scholarships like you told them. Mm -hmm. And so you're you're starting to pay back these student loans. And so I know, Gina, you talked about, you know, paying one credit card and then using that money to pay the next bill and using that money once that's done. So how, what advice do you give to parents or even students that are out of school, how to tackle that whole student loan um, debt? That, that goes with what Elias said. Um, again, it starts with discipline and mm-hmm. um, teaching them that, you know, when you're in college, don't get into debt. Don't get those credit cards that they are um, giving you um, every day. You got right. the application. And then, um, go ahead. The reason I, th- I think one of the things is, is the reason college funds are so hard to pay, co- student loans are so hard to pay back is because you got a bunch of other debt. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So one mm-hmm. of the things that we did very uh, aggressively is attacked our, like our consumer debt. We had a few credit cards, a few loans and blah, blah, car loan. We attacked that like crazy, freed up a bunch of money. Now, on a monthly basis, we can put money on a student. If we had student loans, we can pay those off pretty easily. And the thing about student loans is that they're usually low interest. The, the, the right. interest rates are low. Right. So you can double up on them. You can make double payments, make triple payments, pay $500, $1,000, pay what you can pay and get out of it sooner as you know sooner than later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I, I would think, I would say the... The um, probably the step one would be attack your your consumer debt mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then free up your money to pay you pay down your student loans. Um, I I know you talked about mutual funds, and I know through my job with uh, King County, um, I've been putting money into mutual funds, and um, you know I was told if if you did that later on in life that you should it should be aggressive because you, you're trying to kind of make up for lost time. And I think you kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, if you start late in life, it's not too late, but yeah. but you have to kind of pay, play catch up. Is that correct? Yes and no. So depending on how late in life you're talking about, you might not want to get too aggressive because um, you understand when you're aggressive, that means the money could do this. And the oh. day that you want the money, it could be in the toilet and you don't want you don't want that. But with aggressive funds, you have the ability to get higher rates of return and grow your money faster. Mm-hmm. So um, we, we what we do is we take you through a whole little questionnaire and it's just a few questions um, to find out your your risk tolerance. Right. How how much risk can you can you withstand and your time horizon? How long you want that money? How long are you going to need this money? If you don't need it for 30 years, then you can withstand large, big dips in the market. If you need it next year, you don't want to do that. You want to do something a lot lot less aggressive. So it really depends. And again, that's what we do is we take you through this whole process and we'll figure out exactly where you should be. I mean, even even at work. So the cool thing is even even at work, um, I've done this with people 
is we'll go through a, a little bit of a scenario and find out how they should maybe be thinking about their and in, their investments, which could be mutual funds, and then they go back to work and make adjustments based on those numbers because that's one of the things that I find um, at work. They give you a little information, but they don't really give a comprehensive plan for you specifically. They kind of give you a broad stroke on what you, you know, you employees should be doing, but that right. might not work for you. You right. might want to be a little bit more aggressive or you might want to be a little bit more conservative. It just depends on you specifically. It looks like there's a question. Um, how do you get the credit card increase off your credit report when you did not ask for an increase? That's well, a good question. It's a great question. One thing you can do is you write a letter. Um, I don't have one here right with me, but you can write a letter to the credit bureau um, TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax and say, I need verification that I asked for a credit card increase. If you mm -hmm. cannot verify this, and I think it's, they have 30 days to, to reply, then you need to remove that from my credit, my credit report. My other question. And that's what, and that's what any, that's what any um, inaccurate information, if they can't verify it, then they have to remove it. And you okay. have the right, the Fair Credit Reporting Act says that you have the right to ask for verification. The other question is, um, I'm, I'm not, I can't remember if you guys talked about budget and, and I know I've seen this where you have envelopes, this is for entertainment. And I know you talked about pay yourself first, mm -hmm. um, pay your tithes mm -hmm. self. Um, but I tend to, uh, when I be paying myself, It'd be like a little bit more than the tides and stuff. Hmm. And so I'm not sure if that's good, but it all goes into not the tides part, but the it all goes into that checking, that so-called emergency fund checking. So it's commingling is yeah. what it is. And so I know that's not good. Um so what do you think about like budgeting, whether it's every two weeks when you get a person gets paid or once a month, just to kind of um, um, help help you kind of figure out where you're spending money, where you shouldn't be when you're trying to get out of debt? Well, I, I say that you set it up all systematically, right? So let's say let's say your 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 rent or mortgage check is at the first of the month, right? And then you have a check that we used to call it our free check at the second half of the month, right? So set up your, your we call it a pre-authorized checking, a PAC, a PAC. Mm -hmm. Set up your PAC, maybe the $50 to your emergency fund to come out at the beginning of the month. And then set up your, your $100 to your wealth building account and your $100 to your short-term account on the second half of the month. And they come out on the day that you get paid. You don't see it. You don't miss it. You don't mm -hmm. have to mourn the loss. You don't go through any of those things. But mm -hmm. you feel great because you know that you're paying yourself. And when it says pay yourself first, that means don't even think about it. Don't even consider it. Just pay it. And the pay way it. to do that is set it up systematically so you don't have to, you don't have to navigate that. My other question is, should you have all these different accounts? So you have one for your savings, your checking, your emergency fund. Is is that what you're saying, basically? Yeah. So you should have a you should, you should have three investment accounts: uh, emergency fund, which we'll do in a money market, short term, uh -huh. and then a long term wealth building account. And if you don't have a Roth IRA, I would say that's that's where that money needs to go into an IRA, your retirement account. Right. right. But I mean, if you're budgeting, so you, you said your emergency, should I have a separate account for yes. emergency? You should have an emergency, oh. a short term, uh, an emergency. Oh, that's the emergency. Okay. An okay. emergency account. Then you should have a short term savings account. Then you should have your wealth bidding account, which is your retirement. And then you're checking in your savings. And then you're checking in your savings. I got and maybe it. You have, maybe you have two check-ins because, you know, um, one of the things that we advocate is starting a business. Start start your own business. Start a side hustle or something. Maybe you should have a checking account for that so that you can um, monitor your expenditures and write your taxes and all that stuff. So, okay. I mean, many accounts is not a bad thing. Okay. Okay. Does anybody else have anything? <laughs> Just remember your password. Yes. Yes, that's the problem. <laughs> Um, does anybody else have any questions? I think a lot of people have stated that they appreciate 
um, this um, webinar and to you, Elias and Gina, thank you so very much. Well, please, I would, I, would, I really implore you to it, to uh, take the survey. Click on that that link there, and take the survey. Um, and you have to click on it before the Zoom meeting's over, or else you, you'll miss it. So you can click on it now and just leave it in the background, and then take the survey, and then watch that video at the end of the survey there's another link just keep going clicking through and at the end there's a, a video that you watch and then for everyone that goes through that we have a free gift that we'll send you the survey is is it's in the chat so if you click on it now and then have it in the background and then you can kind of go later and and fill it out but if you, I'm, we're asking everybody to please click on the survey. So Elias, I want to ask you, you and Gina, um, the link is, it's just, it's a little bit, there you go. Thank you, Gina. Um, the other thing is part two, part two, talk, talk to us a little bit about part two, what's coming up, what, what we need to look for. Because basically you guys have to understand this is boot camp, money boot camp. That's what the that's what they're giving us. And we're so thankful that they're providing this to us, to the community. So we have to take advantage. So I'm asking you for part two, all of those that are here tonight, to bring somebody, to bring at least one person with you, because this is so important in order for us to generate um, generational wealth, to pass things down to our children. Because what I'm learning now, if I'd have known 15, 20 years ago, you know, don't, My son wouldn't be like, I only got ten dollars for gas. You know what I mean? Don't bring, don't bring that up, please. Okay, <laughs> but you know angry. what I mean. She gets angry. <laughs> Nobody told me this. I mean, she goes yeah. into rage. <laughs> yeah, no one told us that. I didn't <laughs> notice this, and so. What, what I'm saying to you guys is to bring at least one person. If you can bring two or three, that'd be great. But it, I'm just asking if you bring, this is our one person. This is our money boot camp, and we need to take advantage. These guys are providing their time and their energy because they could be doing something else, but they're here tonight educating us. And so I'm so thankful. So tell us about what is in store for next month. So next month, we are doing How Money Works with an uh, emphasis on debt. So it'll be How okay. Money Works with Debt. So we're going to be talking through debt and credit and that type of stuff. Okay, that's awesome. Um, and then I do have um, a couple of announcements, if you guys can just bear with us. The Seattle King County NAACP is, is sponsoring a vaccine day April 24th at the Rainier Beach Boat Launch. So you have to schedule an appointment in order to get your vaccine. So we're encouraging everyone to get out there and get vaccinated. Um, so you can go to our website, seattlekingcountynaacp.org for the information. We also have, you guys missed a really good legislation um, uh, town hall that we had last Sunday, but okay, you can always go online on our YouTube channel, which this um, webinar will be on our YouTube channel also. Oh, but wow. May viral, hey. May, May 1st is, um, we have another webinar which deals with trade. And so basically not everybody is meant to go to college, um, which my son tells me that all the time, but I was like, dude, you're already out. So you're just about out. So it's too late. But for those that, um, are just college is not for them, but they may be interested in um, plumbing or carpentry or construction. This is a webinar to attend also because you can get a minimum of a 60,000. That's just the minimum, you know, and we need plumbers in, in, in construction and all of that kind of stuff. So May 1st, it's um, a trade webinar, go to our website. And um, to get that information, you'll also see the information about part two um, of our money boot camp. I think I want to change the name to money boot camp, but that's just me. Um, so Let's do it. I'm all for it. Any, is there any, if there's any other questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we want to thank our, our president, um, Ms. Carol Riley Payne, um, for allowing us to do this. Um, and shout out to our first vice president, Mr. Claude Burfett, 
Um, and thank you to everyone. Do you guys want to give just a last, some little fruit for thought, as my aunt used to always say, give me a little fruit for thought? Yeah. Um, most of us are here and we want to be here, right? And it seems like it's a huge chasm, but it's not. You can get there if you just implement a few basic principles and, and hold yourself accountable. And we'll, right. we'll you, and we'll help you do that. Step do the step. survey. Do the survey. Um, do the survey. I'm giving you guys a little bit of time to get on there right now and 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 click on that survey because once we end it, you have to wait till next month, and you don't want to wait till next because they want to know what um what your feedback, and so that's important for them. Um. Um. So. With that being said, I'm going to see, how do you get other business companies involved to offer training for webinar? Is that for me? Is that question for me? That must be for you. It must be for me. You can contact me, um, vice president, the number two at Seattle King County NAACP. And I can, um, we can talk about that. Um, so thank you. Elias, thank you, Jean. I appreciate the energy. I appreciate the love. I appreciate the knowledge. I well, we appreciate you because you are you are um, paving some pathways and and really caring about the community. And we we so are aligned with your vision for thank providing you. people with 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 positive and useful information. So thank you so much. I appreciate. I needed to hear that. You have no idea. My other thing is, I just want to correct Elias when he said. The membership for one year is actually just thirty dollars. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. You, you can just go on to Seattle King County NAACP.org and all of your information about part two, about the trade webinar, about the vaccine day, and any other information is on our website. I thank you so very much. God bless. And um, wear your mask, wash your hands. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. All right, bless you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.